It's a Friday morning, so everybody, welcome to History Matters. So does coffee, and I really do have coffee this week, and I really needed it. So um, this this week, I, I've been thinking about this episode, and I, I, I think this might have been something from the 70s, and I don't know if it lasted beyond that. Do you guys all remember um, on, on like shows that were normally kind of light dramas, and then there'd be like the episode on pregnancy or the episode on suicide, and then it would say, this week on a very special episode of. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know if they still do that, but I remember that. So I've been thinking, I've been thinking about that all week, and I will explain what I mean by that. But um, at any rate, we're going to talk about, or the title is on hate and loss and love, finding your way in the dark. It is going to be a little bit of an unusual episode. You'll see why, um, but there's history in it because we are the history matters community. Um, and you guys are going to have to be a little patient with me. So, okay. Uh, I now turn to my partner in crime, Annie, who will explain the rules of the game. Good morning, everybody. I'm Annie Evans from New American History, and I am delighted to be here, especially this week with our community, our wonderful community. If you're new, um, you picked a very interesting week to join us. <laughs> But um, just, just so you know, if you're joining us from Facebook, um, I think you guys have kind of your own chat going on. But if you're joining us on Zoom, we have a very long chat going on. And there's also a bingo card involved. Uh, and so people play bingo sometimes. But the question and answer box is where you want to put your questions that have to do with this week's topic. And that's where I will look for them in about 30 minutes. And then I will help Joanne navigate all those questions. So we'll see you in a little bit. Point. Um, and I do want to say that indeed, this is a very special episode of History Matters. Um, it's not typical. Uh, typically, every week, uh, I sort of launch from something in politics and talk about how history can help us decode it or navigate it in some way. And I'll be kind of doing that today, but um, in an unusual way. So if you're new to History Matters, um, this is not a typical episode. Uh, hopefully, it will still be a useful episode. Uh, and if you're new to History Matters, I hope you will tell people in the chat box because we are really a community here in ways that I'm about to talk about. Um, and they will, as I always say, I like to use the word robust. They will give you a robust welcome if you just introduce yourself and say, this is my first time or my second time here. Please do, uh, because we're a community. Communities, we like people to join us. Okay. Um, but I'm not going to start with community and, and um, well, I guess I am going to start with community. Uh, the words I have in front of me, once again, I didn't print out um, what I'm going to say, so uh, you guys are going to have to humor me in many ways this week, um, including the fact that I'm reading notes off the screen. But at any rate, um, these are obviously in um, many ways right now, more ways than we can count probably. They're dark times. And somehow or other, they seem to keep getting darker. Now, I've probably said at least 185 times over the last 185 episodes that we're a community here at History Matters. I've already said it three times today, I think. And we are, right? We know about each other to a remarkable degree, as one can online and sometimes offline. We care about each other. And although I can't always read the chat as I'm talking each week, I can see that in the chat box. We are teachers and students. We are rabbis, hello, Rabbi Beth, and writers, observers, and doers, and thinkers. We meet here every week. We talk about democracy in one way or another, always democracy. We talk about politics as a starting point. We talk about how history can help us understand those politics. We talk about our country. We don't all agree. That's a very good thing. But we all want things to be better for all of us, for everyone, not just us. And if that's not a community, I don't know what is. So we are a community. Um, and this is part of why I picked this topic for this week. Now, obviously, thinking about darkness, um, 
I was thinking about what we're watching unfold in the Middle East. Um, I'm not going to comment on that. The darkness is there all by itself, uh, but it, it's profound. The darkness, profoundly dark. In a very different way, I'm thinking about the current state of affairs in the United States politically, um, what's unfolding in the House of Representatives and what it suggests about the state of our nation. And although I am a historian of Congress, that's about all I'm gonna say about that today. I know there's much, much more we can talk about, unfortunately, talking about these dark times. We can all add to that list. And of course I can, this is where it's gonna get hard. Okay. Some of you may not know that newbie the history bird died on Monday. Um, a member of our community, which he certainly was, died. A member of our community who peeped and bell banged and occasionally showed his bird butt. I went looking through old pictures of things and was very amused to see somehow or other an image of him showing his bird butt <laughs> to everyone on camera. Must have been one of the episodes, a holiday episode when the cage was behind me. Now, I'm really not comparing that one death to everything that's happening in the world, not by a long shot. That honestly would be obscene. But watching people react to that one little death has been showing me something or teaching me something or maybe better offering me something this last week. And I want to offer it to you. In one way or another, it's been showing me how people find their way in the dark, how they respond to, among many things, death, a loss, a darkness that can't be compromised. So this is what I thought we could talk about this morning, basically finding our way in the dark. Um, what people do to penetrate the darkness, what I've been seeing people do, and how that might help us on a bigger, darker stage. Um, I'm even going to weave some history into the mix. Of course, how could I not? This is History Matters. Um, as I said at the outset, uh, and as Annie said, it's an unusual episode. Uh, so I don't quite know how this will go. And I have absolutely no idea <laughs> how the Q&A will go. Um, so it's an experiment. Um, but this is such a time that we're in that I thought this was a week when we could risk that kind of experiment. Okay, so what have I learned by watching people respond to newbies' death this past week? Well, for one thing, people have really shown their humanity and reached out to touch the humanity of others. They've talked about the love they felt for a little green bird, so much love for Newbie. I, I've actually been surprised. I mean, I knew Newbie was a real presence, especially here in our community. Um, I got hundreds of people reaching out all over the place, telling me how much Newbie meant to them, how he helped them get through the pandemic um, in ways I really never imagined. Newbie touched people. Um, and I'm, I'm reminding, maybe I'll do it at the very end, um, in response to that, I've created a GoFundMe to do something in honor of newbie uh, towards a charitable cause, but we'll come back to that. Anyway, I've seen all of these people pouring out love for this little green bird, and they've talked about how that love and how the joy they felt uh, has helped them in dark times. And they reached out to me in that same spirit. And I have to say, part of what got me through the past week has been that flow of humanity, of people. When I was really upset, and I know this is like maybe the worst thing you can do, I went to my phone and I looked to see if there were more responses um, because I knew I was going to find community and love and support and other people sharing what I felt. The humanity of people, our humanness, 
and the humanness of others is like the ultimate anchor in dark times, right? We, we have to remember it because it's easy to forget it. Uh, we have to remember our shared humanity. We have to embrace it and we have to reckon with it in dark times. And particularly looking to the Middle East, we have to cling to that um, because there's so much going on there and so much death um, and so much hate uh, and some of it spreading here. Um, what's happening there, regardless of who you're talking about, is a human story. It's not governments battling up here. It's people, it's a human story, human suffering, human loss. And I just think amidst all of the nastiness and hatred and accusations that we're seeing in so many ways on so many levels in the Middle East and in our own country, we really, really need to remember that we're watching the unfolding of a human story that we all have a shared humanity and it's so easy to forget that in the darkness and we can't lose that. Okay. What else have I seen this past week? Um, well, one thing people said, and I certainly shared it with them, a lot of people said that they really didn't expect Newbie to leave so soon, um, that they were surprised at the suddenness of his death. And of course I was too, he was here for three years. That sounds like a very short amount of time. He made a big impression in a very short amount of time. Um, but it was sudden to everyone and to me, uh, a shock. It really was in a number of days that it happened. Um, so in essence, what I've been watching is people have been saying that they were shocked that he went away. Um, that they didn't quite know how to handle it. Newbie's death made people cry. Um, again, I come back to this at the end, but the response to people and the way they reached out has really fortified me in a lot of ways. But at any rate, we've been watching people wrestle with the suddenness of the death of my small green bird. And so in essence, I've been watching people grapple with the fragility of things of many things, maybe of everything. I've been seeing them saying in one way or another, this was a shock, they never thought he'd leave and that we shouldn't take things for granted. Now, I, I wrote down here in my notes, I have no idea if we're playing bingo this week, but we are. <laughs> and that means uh, people are about to get bingo because this is where I mentioned contingency. Um, we live in a constant state of contingency. We don't know what comes next. We don't. We think we do. Sometimes we're lucky, but more often than not, we don't. We don't know what comes next. As I've said here many, many times when I've been talking about the study of history as a historian, contingency is so central in studying history because people in the past didn't know what would come next which sounds obvious, but it's really easy to forget that. People in the past were looking forward in time. They didn't know what was coming next. And we have to remember that when we try to understand them and their actions. That's how they lived their world. That's how anyone lives their world. And that's how we are living through our world at the moment. We don't know what comes next. That's part of the... Um, angst and nervousness and pain of this moment is that a lot of possibilities, there are a lot of possibilities about what come next and a lot of them aren't pleasant. Um, and some of them might be wonderful, but how we're gonna get there, we haven't figured out yet. Um, so we're, I, I think I've said extreme contingency. We live in a time of extreme contingency. It's not the first such time, but boy, is it a big one. Um, and so, you know, we should be thinking about the fact that we shouldn't take things for granted. We should look ahead as we 
think about people in the past and what they do to judge what comes next. We should use wisdom of the past history to guide us in what we're doing in the present. And I just think that's so important to remember in dark times, not because I want everyone to feel like, oh, everything's contingent, I'm on the edge of a cliff, which I talk about often in the 1790s, how um, that, that generation of people who were creating an experiment in government were living in a moment of extreme contingency when they thought one stupid thing and the entire new government might collapse. Um, I'm not saying, wow, it's really good to feel like that. But I think realizing the contingency of things, the value of things, which you realize when you think about the fragility of things and how easily they're lost, that reminds you why things matter. It, it shows you the value of things. It's a reminder about things that are worth working for, things that are worth defending, things that are worth preserving, things that mean something. If you understand they're fragile, you understand the fact that they need protecting. Now, of course, um, I'm thinking here, uh, as and I probably every week have talked about American democracy. That is what I'm thinking about right here. Um, it's more fragile than many of us, maybe any of us thought before semi-recent years. Certainly as a historian, my historian brain may have recognized that, um, but every other brain uh, in my head didn't fully grasp what that meant or felt like. So the fragility of American democracy, um, I think in some ways, is teaching us the value of American democracy and the fact that you have to work for it. You have to defend it. You have to preserve it. And I've said this before, democracy is a process, not an end point. And we couldn't have a starker reminder of that than the times in which we're living, which brings us back to community, us. Different communities have reached out to me this past week, um, and it has meant more than I can say, and I thank you and all of them for it. Online communities, even on Twitter, <laughs> they still exist. History and academic communities, my community of family and friends, and of course, our community. I've been watching and feeling in a a deeply personal way, how community, a sense of community, the realities of community, even an online community is real in its way, how communities can keep us stable and hopeful in the dark. Now, I, I realize I thought about this as I was taking my notes this morning. Um, I'm almost preaching a sermon of democracy. <laughs> I, you know, as I said, in today's episode, very special episode of History Matters, it, this is unusual. And, it, and it, as I was thinking about it this morning, I realized in some ways it sounds kind of like a sermon. I don't mean it that way, but this is what the last week has made me think. And um, I just think it, it's not just me who's going to value these things. I think that, um, as I said, I've been in my own little personal darkness and whatever I'm seeing people do in their response to little newbie applies to many darknesses that are much bigger. So what communities do is, is pretty vast if you think about it. And this, I suppose, is my biggest lesson of the last week. Communities anchor us. They remind us that we matter, that we matter to other people. They remind us that we belong. They join us with others when it's really easy to turn against people. Communities enable us to join together to make change. And I know I've talked about that before um, a lot and certainly, at, and even um, on podcasts and all over the place that a way to affect change it's not necessarily top down, but bottom up. It's people coming together in one way or another 
and working together to make change. Communities create an us. And in so doing, they offer hope. Hope to make change. Hope to endure. Hope to endure with others. Now, that's all cheery. Community. Um, and of course, the simple fact is communities sometimes um, aren't enough and they can't necessarily make change. And the example of this um, that I was thinking of when I was pondering what I was going to say this morning is actually Benjamin Brown French. Um, and, and somehow <laughs> I find it amusing that I'm like anchored in the present moment talking about what we're all experiencing. And in my mind, I guess historian brain says, you know, Benjamin Brown French had a similar <laughs> moment. That is what I thought. Um, but it was striking to me and I remember it touched me in a way when I was finishing my last book, um, my last book, The Field of Blood. Towards, well, right before the opening of the Civil War, when it's looming on the horizon, at that point, Benjamin Brown French, who um, was a former clerk in the House of Representatives, boy, would he have things to say. <laughs> I hadn't even thought of that. Was a former clerk in the House of Representatives. And then in later years, and the year that I'm going to be talking about right now, he was, um, I believe, the nation's leading Mason, very high up in the order of Masons. and. His wife, actually, he was sitting at his wife's bedside. She was dying. He was thinking about the fact that there was a civil war looming. And he clearly wanted to do something. He didn't know what to do. So he reached out to other Masons. He wrote a letter to, and I don't know if it was like to the head of every local Mason unit. I don't know specifically, but he reached out to a vast number of Masons. And he essentially said to them, we're a community. Where are we? And each one of us individually knows so many people. If we reach out, each of us, to as many people as we can, maybe we can affect change. Maybe we can at least help people hear each other. Maybe we can do something good. Now, it's poignant, right, that on the edge of civil war, French thinks, you know, if we all reach out, we can help this not happen. Of course, again, looking forward in time, he didn't know what the, a actual civil war was going to happen and what it meant and the, the blood that would be shed within it. But still, the idea that he understood a crisis was coming and that he thought that reaching out to fellow Masons would save the day or at least affect positive change. I found that touching and in a sense sad because it didn't work. Um, some people responded and appreciated the spirit in which he was writing. Not everyone did. Um, and I remember finding a letter from um, a Virginian, I believe, who wrote back to French and said, really, you? you expect us to somehow come together and, and do something as a community? Like you, a northerner, and you and your people are going to come marching down into the south and slaughter us by our firesides? Really? You want that? No. No. French didn't answer that letter. Um, how could he? Uh, and it makes sense in that moment. So I'm not necessarily saying um, that working in communities, being a we and us always makes good things happen. It may it, or it may not. It does all of these other things I've talked about today that are vitally important, anchoring us and helping us get through what we're doing and helping us just remember our shared humanity. Communities, big and small, offer us a grasp of our shared humanness and our understanding of the meaning and value of the people and ideals that surround, surround us. And although I very obviously have no idea how to help us get out of our darkness, I can't lead us out. I didn't think you would have assumed I could, but I think 
people are looking for, for a way out. And I don't think anyone knows that right now, but I think when we find our way out, community and humanity um, are gonna be really important things to cling to, to join us and to help us get to someplace better. They seem ethereal. They seem, um, you can't pin them down. Uh, you may think I'm talking in platitudes um, and big generalities, but I mean that in a very concrete way. Um, that communities and our recognition of our shared humanity on the biggest scale possible, our understanding of the meaning and value of people uh, and the ideals and aspirations that surround us and the fact that others have them too, somehow or other, our shared humanity will be part of how we find our way out of the darkness of our current moment. And that's the newbie news. Okay. Mug, thank you. Um, I had my, I had my um, notes up over the screen. Um, so I couldn't see the mug, mug, mug. Um, my mug this week, I, I think it's a Carolee mug. Oh, that's definitely a Carolee mug. It's my little newbie. It says on the back, <laughs> B to B to B to B, and that's the newbie news. Oodly oo, peep, 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 and that's the newbie news. <laughs> it's wonderful the recognition of, of newbie. So he's here. Oh, and I should say on the bottom, it says oodlying for democracy every Friday morning. Um, Perfect. Yeah. So um, I know I kind of said it uh, earlier in my comments, but I'm going to say it now specifically. Thank you guys for reaching out. Um, honestly, I I say like and have said a hundred million zillion times at the end of every single episode we do that we're a community, but I didn't feel it more powerfully than I did in the last four days. So thank you for that. Okay, now I'm going to catch my breath so that I don't start crying in front of you. Um, I did it. I did it. I did it. You did. You got through that. I don't know how you did it because we were all cried in the chat. Yeah, I, um, I shouldn't have said that because now, well, anyway, uh, mm -hmm. let's, let's move on to Q&A. Okay. And as I said before, man, I don't know how this is going to go. <laughs> I don't know, I don't, I want us to share and have a conversation. Okay, I'll, I'll stop talking and we can see where it'll go. So our good friend Cece says, since Field of Blood talked about violence in Congress, it seems like it would have been a very dark time, especially for people who maybe expected better. How did some people react or act in a positive and helpful way around that violence? And are there lessons in there for that now? Well, actually, I mean, I didn't have the time to research this, but, you know, Benjamin Brown French was the most obvious example of him reaching out and um, wanting the Masons to affect change. But the ways in which people use their particular us to, to touch other people and, and cross lines that people couldn't cross, that's one part of an answer to the question. You had relatives finding ways to cross between north and south and 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 share and get past boundaries um actually uh, on battlefields the masons did do something and that is um like i know for a fact and it's been a long time since i looked at this book there's a book about the masons during the civil war and among the things in there it shows how if you were a civil war soldier um and you know, there was a person who you knew either was a fellow Mason or someone told you this person was a fellow Mason. If you knew that you came across a fellow Mason on the field, it was your job to defend that person, regardless of their side. And if there was a belonging, I think I read about in that book, there was a watch 
maybe it was a Southern soldier's watch and somehow or other it was revealed that he was a Mason and Northern Masons very carefully made sure that that watch got to the family of that Southern soldier who died in battle. So um, one answer to that question, I think is, is that very thing. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I keep, I realize that this might sign, what I'm saying this morning might sound very much like platitudes, um, but I mean, I mean what I'm saying in a very, very, very real way. And I couldn't have felt that more this week. And so when I say community is one way in which people grappled with the Civil War, um, again, that's people reaching, using their ties with others to cross boundaries and cross lines. And this happened in all kinds of ways that, you know, we, people didn't see. We certainly don't see. We have to dig it for it, right? But you have to know that that was happening all the time. So that was part, I, I think, um, of what people were doing. I also think they, and this is going to sound really kind of, I don't know, Pollyanna-ish, but um, I think people had some sort of a shared sense that in the end, whatever the end was, there was going to be some sort of we that came out of it and that that mattered too. So I don't think people went into that war thinking um, it's every man for himself and that's all it will be. Um, I think they were thinking bigger than that and that sometimes that was comforting. So much going on in the chat, uh, a lot. Uh, okay, I know. Troy asks, um, might an ongoing closer study of community organizing give us a bottom-up way of institutionalizing a way up and out of anti-democratic darkness? Well, you know, it's interesting. Um, I'm not going to be able to place this in time, but at some, at some point in the last, I don't know how many years, um, I remember people were passing around like guides for local organization, for coming together locally and how to affect change. Um, in a way that feels profoundly optimistic, like here, you too can organize, read the guide. But I remember people were thinking about that. And I remember um, talking about that actually on a backstory episode, um, which was my previous podcast. Someone just got uh, bingo. My previous podcast before I was my most recent one with, with Heather, um, we had an episode where we talked about organizing uh, and just the simple fact that local organizing and small scale organizing and bottom up organizing um, was the most powerful way of organizing in American history, always. And, you know, I, I suppose I think about this as a teacher, but I look at young people today, which makes me sound 892 years old, but I look at the new generation and they have a real sense of a we and they have a sense that they can affect change and they're going to step up and act. And yep. that's hope, right? That, that gives me hope. That gives me hope all the time. Um, it also makes me feel that uh, I would prefer it if we don't say, well, the next generation will take care of it. Because um, that's not responsible. Say that too long. <laughs> right, we've been saying that for way too long. Um, but I think that historically speaking, and not just in the United States, um, what you see is that ground level, small scale organizing for all of the reasons that I talked about in today's episode can bring people together in a powerful way to effect change. Now, of course, not all of that change is, is positive, but, you know, you can define change in many ways. So um, we have to surround that statement with all kinds of um, buts and what's and ifs. But the simple fact of the matter is, and if you just think about it, you know it's true. Whatever local groups you belong to, they're yours, right? They're your people. And if they come together to do something, you're going to do it in a way that you would never do it by yourself. As a matter of fact, a, a, a really, um, I don't normally talk about my politics in any way, or I try not to, but um, even though they're probably obvious, but an example of this power of community was um, 
a million zillion years ago uh, in the, I don't know when, forever in the past. Um, I was reading about uh, attacks on abortion and this was a long time ago. I was like not that long out of college, I think. But I was reading about you know Operation Rescue and attacks on women's right to have an abortion. And um, I there was a meeting, it was either Planned Parenthood or now, uh, first I started reading and looking at things because I was getting concerned. And I, of course I was like, are other people getting, you know, is it just me? It was like, no, a lot of people are. And then I came across and I looking at newspapers, oh, one or the other Planned Parenthood or, or um, the other one just went, I don't know. Uh, Planned Parenthood and give me the name of the other one. Uh, oh, um, mm. now. Okay. Anyway, I don't remember what it was, but NARAL, thank you. NARAL, okay, yeah. yep. Um, one or the other of them had a meeting for people who were feeling like I felt. And I went to the meeting and people talked and I realized, oh, look at this. I'm in a room full of people and we all agree and we all have a sense of danger. So that group decided that they would um, find a way to defend clinics, physically to defend clinics. We, and, and this was either NARAL or probably NARAL, taught us, and I'm sure this was happening not just in my little group, passive resistance and how to fight off people without attacking people. Like I learned, <laughs> I learned how to sit on people if they run at you, right? I learned passive resistance. Um, and then every Saturday morning for a big long chunk of time, I got up really early in the morning and um, groups of us would go and stand in front of uh, abortion clinics and help people get in and fend off anyone who tried to prevent that from happening. Now, I was never an activist, really. You know, I wasn't someone that that came naturally to, but there's a great example of my finding my way into a group of people that got me into a bigger group of people that led me to be standing with a group of people really in the face occasionally of danger, we were attacked once and it was a huge police action and um, there was violence and someone was pushed through a plate glass window and it was, it was, you know, and we were standing there as a group. Uh, and, you know, I don't know how much we knew about each other, a little, but boy, we, we were a we and we were willing to do that. So um, that took me far afield. Um, I'll, I'll stop there. I'm not even going to know how to tie that thread back to where it started, but you guys could do that, could connect the thread back to back to where we started. It's a lot of feels today, Joanne. I Tell me about it. Okay, so Daniel. Hi, Daniel. Uh, Daniel writes, as time goes on, it seems to me there's a tight connection between incompetence and authoritarianism. No matter the political ideology, it seems one if one can competently run a country, one can succeed with open society. If one got there by charm personality and can't do the job, there's a rapid descent toward totalitarianism to hold power, whether it's Russia, Venezuela, or the last president or the feudal nations. Does this seem to make sense to you, he asks. So in other words, if, you, if you're but get in on your charm and good luck, so to speak, but then you don't have the stuff to really do the job. He's wondering. Sure, right, that's demagoguery. I'm charming, I can appeal to people, I can make them like me, I can say whatever the heck I can say in this moment so that they'll, they'll like me and they'll wanna give me power and then you get power and who the heck knows what you can do or what you're going to do or if you can do it, right? That's, that's the, you know, the haunting idea of demagoguery that in the, the founding era, um, they consider to be so dangerous. But I also think a, a, a sort of variation on that that we see all the time nowadays, and it's um, particularly strong uh, in the Republican Party, I guess I'm talking for the most part, or thinking for the most part about Congress, and that's performance, right? That, that performing to make a point, but not doing more than that. Performing, uh, to get a reaction, uh, but not thinking about policy or action or work or all of the things you really have to think about 
to do things in Congress. I think that kind of shallow politics also is related to demagoguery and also opens a door um, to bad things, to authoritarianism. You know, I, the simple fact is even chaos, right? Just things being bad. And the simple fact that when things are bad, people want to find their way out. And if some person floats in and says, I'm, I'm the one who can do it, I'm the only one, which is always a dangerous statement. People are gonna flock to that person and bingo, you've got a dictator. So there are all kinds of ways in which authoritarianism can creep in. I think we, again, kind of like we appreciate the fragility of democracy more than we did before. I think we appreciate the, the, that one particular brand of American exceptionalism, that what happens there can't happen here, just doesn't exist because it sure can, right? And, and we're thinking about it and, and grappling with it and worrying about it all the time. So I think there are many roads to authoritarianism. Um, I think we have to be aware of that and not, um, some people still, when I'm sort of pontificating, wherever I'm pontificating, will say, it's not as bad as you think, um, that, you know, you're hysterical, right? That's always a way to swat at a woman. Um, that, you know, we've always been fine before. Um, yeah, that's, talk about platitudes. That's not going to help or get us anywhere. Um, and no two crises are the same. So anyway, I'll stop there too. It's very easy to keep talking on these very big questions. I know, I know. Okay. Um, George Tonkin asked, how did people react to George Washington's death? Oh, interesting. Um, that's interesting. You know, so um, George Washington was like, and people knew this at the time, even on a brass tax political level, they would say all the time in the 1790s when people were very divided in their politics, oh, George Washington is the one man who can hold us together because he was the one man that everybody trusted in one way or another, which is generally true, right? And there really wasn't anybody else. And they trusted him because he was a victorious general in a war who then surrendered power and walked back home, you know, rode his horse back home, went back home. Um, and, and generals don't do that. And by giving up power, he made himself a person who was incredibly trusted with power. That was just not something that tended to happen. So, you know, both, Hamilton and Jefferson in the early 1790s would say to him, you know, he would basically in one way or another say, like, I want out. I'm not enjoying this. And they would say, oh, no, 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 no. You can't. You're the, you're the only person who can hold things together. And I think there was a truth to that. And what's interesting is that when he dies in, uh, I believe, 1799, it's a national event, which is not surprising. Um, and in a way, it, it even at that moment, 1799, we're looking towards what I talk about so often, the election of 1800 and partisanship is gunning, you know, it, in some ways or another, um, it, it brought people together. There's a really interesting book uh, that I haven't looked at for a long time um, called Knowledge is Power. I want to say Brown, Richard Brown, someone, you brilliant people can go and find this for, for me. Um, but the last chapter in Knowledge is Power is a study of how the news of Washington's death traveled throughout the nation, how people learned that news uh, and what it suggests. So that's actually a really good example um, of ways in which uh, big events can bring people together or, or at least, um, and big, <laughs> big people, George Washington. Um, sometimes a person can make a difference in a good way, <laughs> someone, there you go. Knowledge is power. The diffusion of information in early America, um, and I think I think Richard Brown maybe. At any rate, thank you. You guys always do that. You always find the good stuff. I do. Um, Susan asks. She said, "I love it when it starts with this is a crazy question." <laughs> this is a crazy <laughs> so question. Many teachers here, right? All the teachers are like. Crazy. There are no such thing. We we've, we've heard it all, right? Yeah, right? What insight can you share about what guides the decision of communities to respond to the stress of an attack with love rather than hate? For example, cherishing newbie part of the choice of pursuing love. 
that sort of thing? Like, is there any sort of historical answer related to this community responded in a loving way, whereas another community responded in a hateful way? Um, I don't know if I have a, like a definitive answer for that, but I would say part of the answer to that has to do with leadership and, and um, who is in a position of leadership at a given moment and what direction um, and emotions, to talk about something we talk about all the time here, they're fueling, right? Um, this gets back to demagogues and um, people you know, with bad intentions. Um, at a given moment in any community, right? There can be someone who steps forward and says, there, this is a time of danger, let's come together. And there can be someone that steps forward and says, all of these people are bad and we hate them and we should come together for that reason. There are all kinds of ways in which you can say there are good reactions and bad reactions. So I think that's part of the answer is the spirit of how people are acting. And sometimes that might be a person in a position of leadership in a group. Sometimes that might just be the way a group goes, you know, the spirit of a group goes. Um, but I think that that can have a huge impact on whether a group goes for good or for bad. You know, um, I guess, was I on Twitter this morning? Yes. Well, I see, I gave, at the beginning, somewhere in the episode, I said, you know, because there are so many kind words on Twitter, I kept going back to Twitter. And this morning, um, AOC um, said uh, something along the lines of, um, there's going to be so much um, so many lies and so much propaganda flowing around on Twitter that you need to stop and think about it. And what she actually said was, um, if you get really emotional, you, you respond really emotionally to something you read, always pause, check to see that it's true and realize that whoever is putting it there may be wanting you to have that emotion. And of course, and I'm sure I responded. Part of me was like, I say this every week, right? Like, this is a big, one of the big messages, right, that we have here is that as a group, you, you study history and among the things, there you go, uh, I see AOC, someone says it, go, go. She said it in an interesting way. And I, I felt so um, sort of, I don't know, validated, right? Look at that. Um, oh, so okay, Miriam saw both. At any rate, um, I think that that's vitally important. It's going to be really important now because we're we're talking about such ugliness and death on such a scale, uh, and people who are um, foul enough and evil enough to use that for um, personal or power purposes. This is a time to think about that lesson, that fact that we've talked about so much, uh, and really remember it, that um, there are going to be all kinds of emotions. In a way, this whole episode is about emotion and the emotional responses that we have to things. And, and right, rage farming, I see someone said, rage, rage harvesting, whatever. That's part of what I'm talking about here. It's going to be so important to do what we talk about, have talked about so often here, which is really pause before you have the response. Really check to make sure that the information is credible. And then think about whether it's credible or not, who put it there and why did they put it there and what might they want? It's really hard to get in the path of emotion, I realize, right? Emotions are like, you know, that, that's how in my book, right? I talk about um, in some way or another, how um, threats led to fear, led to Southerners having a, a lot of power in Congress more than they might have. So it's hard to not go with the emotions, but um, I think we really, particularly right now, need to be really aware of that because there's so many ways that this is gonna play out that um, will not be good. And I don't, not just in the Middle East, but um, in a lot of places. So um, we should be invested in that, uh, but we should think about what we're seeing and what it means um, before deciding what it means. Um, Christy, hi, Christy, asks, did you ever expect a, a, quote, political debate over COVID vaccines being fought between two professional football players and amplified by Taylor Swift fans would be a sign of how an unexpected community could be used for the larger good? 
is that possibly where our nation is headed? Oh boy. Well, the, the last part, I don't know. Careful, Julie, um, on the Swifties. Well, I was going to say, really I'm careful. Not gonna, I'm not going to say anything bad about the Swifties. I actually am only going to say the simple fact that there are Swifties and the impact that she has, like in, in getting people to register to vote. Yeah. Right. That's a community, man. Like, that really is. Right. Is. I'm not going to say anything about it other than you can really work for good with that kind of community. Right. That's, that's You're pretty. Trying. Remarkable. Now, you know, talking about vaccines and Taylor Swift and fighting, um, it makes me think about uh, the yellow fever epidemic um, in the 1790s. Uh, really bad. A lot of people died. People were, you know, fleeing cities in fear. Um, and there's a moment when people were dying. There was this huge epidemic. Um, and you ended up having a federalist cure for that epi the the yellow fever and a Republican cure for yellow fever. Um, and two different cures, two different sort of schools of medicine, two different doctors. There's a moment where, you know, it certainly was on a way different scale, uh, vastly different scale than COVID. But there's a moment where death was in the cards. This was not a moment to sort of gloss over. Um, and uh, communities of a kind that couldn't really see a bigger us um, I did damage. Yeah. Debbie asks, are there any historical lessons about techniques that have been effective in counteracting rage forming? Oh, mm -hmm. um, I'm sure that there are, but I don't know what they are, right? I don't think I can offer you something that concrete. Um, I, actually, particularly given um, the, the vast skill that people here have with looking things up and finding things um you know I, I i don't know if anyone here remembers that but i definitely remember groups small groups uh that had organized giving guides to organizing and how to do it and such things and it would be interesting um to see if out in the world where people are thinking about the playing out of politics on a very real very immediate level if there, if people, I would be surprised if they haven't thought about this before or written about propaganda in a very immediate, present-minded, um, pragmatic way, rather than being an academic and talking about propaganda, um, but but thinking about it in a way along the lines of the question, you know, so how do you, how should you respond, or how can you reckon with that? So um, I don't have the answer. Um, but people must have talked about this before. Um, I'm sure that's an understatement. All right, Christy and Sydney had similar questions. Our, our good undergraduate friend, Sydney, we always love it when she joins us and Christy as well. Um, Sydney was asking how people in general deal with loss, but Christy's question was, can a community have a voice the point in time it feels like democracy, a democracy voice isn't quite loud enough. So how can a community sort of take that grief and use well, it? A community can have a voice. I mean, think about how, and, and these are in a way very specific examples, but think about, actually, what was it recently that I was reading about? Um, was it the principal of a school who didn't like the way a student was dancing and um, basically prevented her from applying for a scholarship. I think that was in the news, right? And there was a big to-do about it. Uh, and although the, I'm not gonna talk about what the what that principal did or didn't do, but he backed away. Think of all the times in which someone steps out uh, and says something or does something stupid um, and people respond loudly, right? Loudly all over the place. People respond online. People respond by calling their member of Congress. People respond um, in all kinds of ways. That can really make a difference. And I, I've been thinking about this, you know, for years, uh, and I've talked about it many times, how in a way that we don't appreciate, because again, it sounds like some kind of platitude, public opinion matters here in a big way. That it was, you know, in the founding era, people said that and they knew that and they didn't really know what it means and they really didn't agree on who was in the public, but they had a lot of ideas about who wasn't in the public. But 
They understood that a, a democratic republic relies on public opinion and, and what the public will to a degree that a monarchy never does. And because of that, they assumed that the public, the voice of the public can have a big impact. Now that terrified founding era folk who are not particularly excited about democracy. Uh, they were afraid of that very thing. But that's in the, the roots of this country is the idea that the people are supposed to have a voice and they're supposed to express it and it's supposed to make a difference. So, um, and I know, I think Heather Cox Richardson has said some version of this too, right? Um, always speak up, always speak up, always step forward. Um, because number one, you will find other people doing the same thing and that matters and they might bring people together. But number two, never underestimate the degree to which stepping forward and speaking and encouraging others to do that, the degree to which that can cause enough power on a, a public level that it can get people to back away or step back. And I'm sure um, a lot of you can think of many, many examples like this, some big, some small, um, there have been some like, you know, policy issues. At some point, there was a healthcare conversation, and Americans responded so aggressively, you know, calling their members of Congress that there was some kind of response. At any rate, never underestimate that power. Um, boy, it really matters because no matter how authoritarian someone wants to be, they can't get there if there are loud, resistant people pointing out what they're doing and telling others the same. So be loud, <laughs> be loud, come together and, and be loud, regardless of how futile it might seem. All right, so we've, it's exactly 11 o'clock. We've done all the questions, but one that is really more of a um, after party one, actually Sydney just popped a new one up. Okay. She wants to know, how did Andrew Jackson appeal to the common man? Was he considered a demagogue? Some considered him that. Um, common man is a big part of his appeal, right? He, he sort of positioned himself as, you know, democracy, small d democracy. I'm the friend of the working man. But of course, he was the friend of the, the white man of a certain kind. Um, he just didn't say that. Uh, but sure, he was presenting himself to the public as that kind of a figure. Um, and if you look at uh, before the Whig Party formed and the Whig Party started out as actually a kind of anti-Jacksonian group of people talking about actually what I'm saying here, a bunch of people come together on their shared fear and hatred of Andrew Jackson. And eventually that helped cohere into the Whig party, um, you could find right there um, all kinds of language. They referred to him as um, King Andrew, I think sometimes too, going in another direction. But um, yeah, he, he had a lot of rhetoric um, about democracy and being the man of the people. Um, and very clearly, uh, he didn't quite mean it as he said it uh, in a variety of different ways. Um, I, 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 we're, I know we're out of time, but I don't know how many of you here remember or saw, I, I believe the title was Bloody Bloody Andrew Jackson. I've Yes, they did that here in Virginia at a, at a theater. That's, heard... that's really interesting. Um, that, that I, of course, there's a historian in it who's like an oaf, like a dope. It's like, why? Yeah, you gotta... But, but the general idea you know, and there's a there's a song called Populism, uh, the power of populism. That's an interesting play to see. So if you have a chance to see it, it very interesting to see. Yeah. I tried to get tickets and it was sold out. And then I was like, gosh, it must be so good because things there don't usually sell out. All I'm right, sorry. we have cleared the deck, except for I'm going to save this other one for the after party. So we did okay. good on time too. Okay, um, we did, look at that. Um, and we actually had a good, coherent conversation uh, with a topic that is very um, feelingly based. And I managed not to collapse into tears. So it's all good. Um, so uh, what's gonna happen now is particularly um, if there are new folk here, uh, you need to know, we are now going to segue into the after party. What that means is that we will stop recording so that we can be even freer and easier in our conversation than we normally are. And we can talk about whatever the heck it is 
we want to talk about. Um, if you are beaming in through Facebook, you need to leave Facebook and go to the NCHE link. And you need to go to nche.teach.org slash conversations. nche.teach.org slash conversations. If you go there, poof, you will be in the after party with us. Now, um, I am going to say at the end of this episode, uh, again, um, thank you to everybody who reached out. Um, it, it meant more than I can say. Um, I'm staring at an empty birdcage. Uh, I've been thinking about a lot of things uh, this week. And this community, I always have talked about us as a community. Um, boy, you were a community this week. And I just want to thank you. Um, and I want to thank you uh, for meeting here on a Friday morning as ever to engage in the conversation of democracy, uh, which even today's episode, as quirky as it was, still part of that same conversation. Um, I hope that uh, everyone has um, a good week. Um, I hope that you will uh, think of community and join with other people as things unfold wherever they're unfolding. Um, because we're all going to need other people because this is just a weird, dark time. But hopefully our conversation today um, can bring some of us together in the darkness in a way that will help. Um, that's really all I wanted uh, with a little history woven in. Um, okay, so um, I think I think that's it, right? Am I forget? Oh, well, well, I know I'm forgetting to say thanks to Annie and John. <laughs> I don't want to forget that. Um, and, and thanks, really, thanks to all of you. Oh, and the one other thing I want to say is um, I did start a GoFundMe before everybody starts to go away and the after party gets a little smaller. I started a GoFundMe um, in honor of Newbie. Um, and I think if you go to GoFundMe and search on Newbie and History Bird, it'll probably come up. Uh, and I just wanted to get money to do two things in Newbie's honor. Number one, um, I wanted to endow a tree in Central Park, uh, which you can do. Uh, and I just thought he was found in Central Park. I found out yesterday from the person who found him exactly where he was found. Maybe I can even endow the tree where he was found. I don't know. Um, that's just supporting the park. Um, but that's one thing I wanted to do. And then the other thing I want to do is just give um, a contribution, a nice, generous contribution to the Wild Bird Fund. Um, here in New York, um, because what they do is take care of abandoned and um, wild birds, like Nudie. As a matter of fact, the person who found him first brought him apparently to the Wild Bird Fund, and I didn't, I didn't know. So anyway, um, go find it if you want. I think as of this morning, unbelievably, we'd raised like eight thousand dollars or something, and it's from you know people giving like normal size donations, meaning. Um, you know, $25, $10. Anyway, I don't want to be like, and, you know, for a brief time only, I don't need to be a commercial advertisement, but I at least wanted to, to put that out there. Okay. Um, I guess I will stop talking and we can segue into the after party. Joanne, the current total, according